Hi everyone, and welcome to this episode. Today, we are beginning our journey into the magical land of chemical equilibrium. And if you're watching this video, you're probably beginning your own journey in your own chemistry class, like my AP Chemistry students are doing. And <clears throat> chemical equilibrium is a lot about chemical balance. And so in this episode, we're gonna in introduce it. We're gonna talk about what chemical equilibrium is, why it occurs, and what, how we deal with it. So let's get started. Imagine a simple chemical reaction. This is very common. You probably likely see one in your textbook or in your class. Hydrogen plus iodine making two HIs, hydrogen iodide, the friendliest compound in the world, I always like to say, because, you know, it's always saying hi. And imagine I am starting this reaction. And we've learned in our previous unit on chemical kinetics that reactions only happen when there's collisions right? And the collisions have to be powerful enough, energetic enough, and in the right orientation. So imagine I start with a container that has only the hydrogens, the white ones, and the iodines, the blue ones, and they start reacting. And if I follow it along for a while, I see in box number two that there are six of these little hydrogen iodide molecules that have been formed. So the reaction is progressing. We still have some unused hydrogen and iodine there as well. By the time we get to box C, this is going in order, we are up to um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 10 molecules of hydrogen iodide. And then by the time we get to box D, we've produced a couple more hydrogen iodides. But it seems like the reaction is slowing down a little bit um, because we're not making big jumps like we were up here. And by the time we get to box E, I count 14 of the HIs. And then in box F, I'm again counting 14 of them. So not much seems to be happening between here and here. And the reason why this reaction tends to slow down, you have to think about collisions. At the beginning, there's only possible collisions between the two reactant molecules. Like that's all that can react and there's nothing else. As more HI gets produced, the likelihood is that those HIs are gonna collide with each other and actually bump back and reform the hydrogens and the iodines that they came from. That reverse reaction gets a lot more likely because there's more possible collisions. And you'll notice I put a double arrow up here, and that is to indicate that this reaction actually goes in both directions. Um, at any given time, some of the HIs are making the reactants and some of the reactants are making products. Um, but after a while, the rate of reaction based on the probabilities of collisions becomes equal in both directions. And yes, they could be changing and, and bouncing around and, and exchanging uh, atoms with each other, but overall the concentration stays constant over time. You will likely see it looking as like a graph. So let's go back. And this is a graph of the reaction. And I partially obscured some of it because back when we did kinetics, we looked really at this part of the reaction where things were changing the HI starts at zero, gets produced, but after a while it slows down, the rate of the reaction slows down, and the H2 and the I2 drop simultaneously together because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and that rate of change also slows down. But maybe you're a curious person, and maybe you lay awake at night wondering, what would happen if I just kept this thing going? Like just didn't stop the reaction and kept this graph going um, indefinitely. And what you would think, what would happen, is that eventually, if we keep going and allow this reaction to come to equilibrium, we get this situation where both amounts, both concentrations level off and they don't change. Now, that does not say that this reaction is not occurring. It just means that the overall concentrations stay the same. I always like to think about two cities on opposite sides of a river where there's a bridge or two bridges, something going between them. And there's always cars going between back and forth, back and forth, but overall the concentrations of the, or the populations of the cities remains fairly constant. And that's what's happening here. We would get a constant concentration after a while. So we call this dynamic equilibrium. So really active on the tiny scale, but on the big scale, not much is happening. So um, now because these concentrations are staying relatively constant, we're gonna take it a step further. And maybe you'd agree with me that if this is constant and this is constant, then the ratio of the reactants and products to each other should also be a constant, okay? And we actually would write that. That's our equilibrium constant. So let me throw that on there. 
And by convention, we write the equilibrium constant uh, in a number of ways, but we're gonna look at the ratio of the products over the reactants, okay? The products over the reactants at equilibrium. And um, in this case, so that's gonna be a constant. If this is constant and that's constant, the ratio will be constant. And we're gonna call it the capital K. This is to distinguish it from the lowercase k we used for rate constants back in the kinetics unit. All right, and products over reactants. And we are going to do the products over reactants in this manner uh, because if, we're gonna go back to kinetics here again. If the forward reaction has a rate law, which we learned in chemical kinetics, they do, and the reverse reaction should also have a rate law, and that'll be constant times A and, a and B, that may be the reactants and the products are over here. What if we set them equal to each other because they're equal to each other? And then rearrange it a little bit. These two constants on one side can wrap into a new constant, that's our equilibrium constant. And then we have the concentrations of the products over reactants. I did this for a generic reaction over here. You'll, this is one you're gonna see a lot as you start out. A, B, it makes C and D, and then there's coefficients. And when we do the math, it works out that the C and D and the brackets denote concentrations, typically in moles per liter. And you get C and D raised to their coefficients. So C raised to the C, D raised to the D, and so on. Always products over reactants. Okay, so that's a generic equilibrium constant expression. Okay. All right, so we had an equilibrium constant expression for the first reaction. Let's do another equilibrium constant expression for a new reaction. This is brand new. We're gonna to return to the other one in just a moment. Um, okay, so you're gonna be asked to write an equilibrium constant expression for reactions. And it's pretty easy to do. You're going to see the reaction up here, products over reactants. So in this case, I will write K. You could do KC or KEQ. C for concentration, equilibrium, just the general equilibrium constant is equal to, we have SO3. And we're going to use brackets for now to represent concentrations. There's a two there, so I'm going to square it over the SO2, also squared, because there's a two in front of it, and then the O2 with a one there, because there's a one coefficient in front of it. So products and minus over reactants and use their coefficients as the exponents. Okay, uh, our first pause the video moment for you to try one. Here's a very common reaction, nitrogen and hydrogen making ammonia, and feel free to pause the video and write the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction. All right, so my equilibrium constant expression hopefully looks a little bit like yours. And there you have it. You have NH3 squared over N2 and H2 uh, raised to the, to the third. Okay, now you might be wondering, um, okay, this is great, it's a constant. Well, what is that constant? Um, is it, it, you know, constants have values, right? They're numbers. And what if we wanted to know what that constant was? And you'll be asked to do something like this, I'm sure, as well. So let's go back to our original reaction. And I've, I've set up what's called an ice table. This may be your first time looking at an ice table. And an ice table is a way of organizing data during and after a reaction. So it stands for initial concentrations, change in concentrations. Sometimes we monitor them over time to see how much they change and final equilibrium concentrations in moles per liter, unless otherwise specified. So let's imagine that my hydrogen and iodine start out nicely at 0.0175. And at the beginning we had zero of this, but let's say after a while, we let it get to equilibrium and the final concentration of the HI is 0.0276. Okay. I measure that. Well, for this to go up by that much and end at 0.0276, these must have gone down by half of that. You're gonna to have to practice your mole ratios again. Uh, every two of those require one of those and one of those, so these are going down by half. And if I subtract out what they changed from what they've started with, I'll get 0.0037 for both. 
And once you have those equilibrium concentrations, it's nice you if you have also, um, you can set up the equilibrium constant expression. Ooh, that's a terrible one. And I'm going to put the H2 and the I2 here. Okay. I always, I always encourage you to write the equilibrium constant expression that you're going to use just so anybody reading your work can see exactly what you're doing from the get go. And there's no questions. And then once you have that in, you want to substitute in your values. 0 0.0276. And we're going to square it because there's a squared there. And then 0 0.0037 and 0.0037 down there. And if I work out the math, I get a value of 55.6. Okay, and I'll put a heart next to it. Um, and now some of you out there are starting to get upset and your spidey sense is tingling and you're wondering why, why is he just leaving that as a number? And there's no unit on it, right? Some of you are probably thinking that. And uh, yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll keep it short. The equilibrium constants, unlike rate constants, are typically left without units. Okay, at some point along the line, chemists decided, man, these moles per liters to the, all the exponents is gonna get really crazy and we're just gonna simplify it. So even though chemists <clears throat> will harp on you all the time about units, especially with rate constants, they arbitrarily decided, let's just get rid of units on equilibrium constants. And so I didn't incur include it and I don't think you have to either. And that way, I also didn't include the moles per liter there because I'm just going for the values. Okay, so you try one. This is our second pause the video moment. Back for our, that other reaction we looked at. We already wrote the equilibrium constant expression. Take a moment and plug in these values and find the equilibrium constant value. Please pause the video and come back in just a second. All right, if you were able to do it and come up with a value of 2.69 is what I got. Here's my original equilibrium constant expression, SO3 squared over SO2 to the, and, S, and O2. And I plugged in the 4.92, squared it, the 2.45, squared it, and the 1.5, worked out the math with the calculator, and I got 2.69. So a value that's lower than my other one, 55.6, this one's much lower, and you're gonna see a huge range of equilibrium constant values. They, they go from infinitesimally small to super large. Um, so don't be surprised by any numbers that you get. But let's pause for a moment and, and think about what that number actually means. And that number has a meaning. It's the ratio of the product of the products over the product of the reactants. And in general, what you're gonna see is that a larger equilibrium constant, let's say one and above, means that there's generally product favored situations going on. There might be more products um, than reactants going on, and the more extreme it gets, the bigger the K value gets. Sometimes the K value is very small, and that means that not a lot of the reactants went away and not a lot of product was actually made, so the ratio is less than one and sometimes way less than one. And so it, it would be a reactant favored reaction. The reactions at equilibrium are very seldom 50-50. It's not like 50% reactants, 50% products. It might be, you know, 60-40, 99-1%. It could be a lot of different things. And our equilibrium constant tries to get at that ratio of the products over the reactants. All right, so I hope this helped you start thinking about chemical equilibrium. And I hope it helps you get started with your equilibrium constant expression problems and working out solutions. There are a lot of different questions that you'll probably be asked about equilibrium, and I'm hoping to address a lot of them in upcoming videos. That said, if you have a question that you'd like me to answer, uh, please put it in the comments or send it to me. And in the meantime, happy solving and have a great day.